Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Virginia Trioli and it's great to be with you live from Melbourne. But our audience tonight is not here in the studio. Instead, it's in Brisbane, a city celebrating being named Olympic host games for the 2032 games. And they're very happy about it too. Joining me on the panel tonight, podcaster, teacher and disability advocate Astrid Edwards, broadcaster and a familiar face from the Gruen transfer, Russell Howcroft, Shadow Minister for the NDIS and Government Services, Bill Shorten, from Brisbane, four-time Olympic gold medalist, Libby Trickett, and from Canberra, Regional Health Minister, David Gillespie. Please make them all feel very welcome. Hello. There are many expats living in Australia as dual citizens who have not been able to see their family in years due to this pandemic. And yet Anastasia Palaszczuk is able to travel to Tokyo freely to bid on the 2032 Olympics. There have also been many events cancelled and restrictions put into place and yet sporting venues are still able to operate at extremely high capacities. My question is, why is sport prioritised over everything else by the Australian government? Thanks so much for your question, Desiree. Sport prioritised over everything else by the Australian government. Astrid, how would you respond to that? I love that question. That is an absolutely fantastic question. I am a teacher and I believe greatly in the arts and literary events, theatre, so many of our other aspects of life are completely constrained with um, social distancing inside. Uh, sport, I know sometimes stadiums are a bit outside and it is um, has a feel of this imperative in Australia we must must support sport and I really genuinely don't understand why why this happens. I suspect that someone on this stage is going to talk about the economic argument and I understand that money matters but I just excellent question. Phil Shorten. I think there was a couple of points in the question. I don't think it should be either or. I think our live entertainment sector has been smashed by COVID and the government hasn't done enough to support it. I think sport is a lifter of hope. It's a bringer together of communities. It shouldn't be a beauty parade, though. But I thought, for me, and what the questioner said, which was most important, is we've got Australians overseas who can't get home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a disgrace. And for me, the real problem in this country is that we haven't handled the COVID-19 outbreak as well as we could have and as a result Australian citizens overseas for legitimate reasons haven't been able to get home and yet you've got other people hopping in and out and I, so I can see why people feel it's it doesn't feel right but as for Anastasia going to Tokyo we've still got to do the day job but it, but for people who've had weddings cancelled or can't see their family or had operations put off I can understand why the perception of a double standard would be really deeply disillusioning but I think the answer is better quarantine and better vaccination rollout. We'll get to everyone on the panel, in particular the Minister, in just a moment. But I wanted to play you part of what was quite an extraordinary press conference this morning with the Queensland <coughs> Premier and the AOC boss, John Coates. Mm. Have a look. You are going to the opening ceremony. I'm still the Deputy Chair of the Canada Leadership Group. <laughs> and so far as I understand that um, there will be an opening and a closing ceremony in 2032. And all of you have got to get along there and understand the, um, the traditional parts of that, uh, what's involved in an opening ceremony. So no, none of you are staying behind and hiding in your rooms, all right? I don't want to offend anybody, so... <laughs> Is, is, is he just speaking um, fluent Olympic there, Libby Trickett, and we just don't quite understand that that's how you speak to premiers when you're the um, head of the AOC? Oh, look, I don't think it was necessarily the finest moment, especially just after the elation of being announced as the, the 2032 host Olympics, um, uh, host city for the Olympics and Paralympics. I think... Um, I guess from my perspective, I think it might have started with being teasy. I don't know what the word is, but it really has not um, been received well, to be honest. And I watched that exchange a couple of times today and felt in my soul that it was very uncomfortable for Anastasia Palaszczuk. Uh, to, she, I, I think she believes that she was doing the right thing in terms of 
perhaps not going to the opening ceremony because a lot of people are a bit um, upset that she has gone over to Tokyo for, for this Olympic bid. And understandably, there's so many things that people are, are dealing with, with in their own lives at the moment. So yeah. I understand why people would be upset about that. So she's trying to limit her exposure, limit the, um, the trip, I guess, to just the essentials. And then to be kind of... I understandably mansplained um, about the importance of the opening ceremony. I mean, I went to three Olympic Games and I haven't been to a single opening ceremony. So uh, <laughs> I understand that they're important. I understand that it's a beautiful um, event and I would have loved to have been a part of it. But also, uh, your job is your job and that's what you're there yeah. to do. And that's what she... Uh, went over to do is to, to do the, okay. the bid for Brisbane. Well, let's, and uh, let's, I just don't think she was able to, to go on and I think that's unfair for her. Let's go to the Minister. Minister, was that an appropriate way for John Coates to be speaking to the Premier of Queensland? Well, I certainly wouldn't have spoken to the Premier of Queensland like that. Uh, the actual attendance at the opening ceremony, though, I think is highly appropriate because uh, we have just been awarded the Olympics. Uh, we have been involved in a long bid process. Uh, Japan has uh, been one of our closest allies in Asia for a very long time, and it would have been a major diplomatic insult if she didn't go. Uh, but the manner and the tone did come across to me as a bit menacing, a um, bit like a schoolmaster talking to a pupil. So, uh, yeah, the politics and the optics is, uh, is not good, but I agree with him, in fact, that, yeah, definitely the Premier and uh, the Mayor of Brisbane, and I expect uh, Senator Colbeck is probably going to be there as well. They're staying on for a few more days, it seems. Um, Russell Howcroft, can't you just send someone from your team to go along and have a look at the opening ceremony? Yes, you can. Um, it, it was very interesting, wasn't it? Because I've watched it a lot of times. <laughs> suspect I thought we might be talking about it. Uh -huh. I thought maybe there's a there was maybe a little bit of inside inside baseball going on. In what way? Yeah, um, maybe there's a conversations that have been occurring. I think there was almost an attempt at not a joke. I'm not sure, but in the end, the oh, tone of voice. I think that was voice, a failed attempt at a joke. Uh, totally. Mm -hmm. In in the end, the tone of voice is really odd, and obviously the crossed arms doesn't help either. Mm -hmm. I mean that's just you know shocking body language, and of course others can go. I mean there. Are, you know, the Australians... Australians are, in fact, experts at putting on Olympics. We, we, there, are, there are executives and staff who go around every four years to Olympics in all the different cities um, who come from Australia who are, as I say, absolute expert at putting, on, at putting on these incredible events. So we do know how to do it. We do genuinely know how to do it. We've done it here and we do it in other countries uh, as well. Well, of course, um, John Coates has said... Uh issued a statement following that and said that the, his comments there to the Premier have been completely misinterpreted by people who weren't in the room. And absolutely, he believes the Premier should come to the opening ceremony and she has accepted. So right. that's going along that. Yes, okay. Astrid. Um, I know that this is linked to um, uh, the 2032 uh, Olympics for Australia, but can we just step back from the Olympics and think about how a man who uh, holds a position of power uh, spoke to one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful woman uh, in Queensland and in Australia. Not only did he mansplain her, he genuinely thought that he had the right to give her directions in public in that tone of voice. Mm. If that happens to uh, a Premier who is certainly able to hold her own, imagine what happens to the rest of us, to women, to women of colour, to migrant women, to people with disabilities, it is just not acceptable in our public discourse. Mm. Well, Absolutely. Well, the menace has always, or already described it as menacing. Do you think there might be some consequences for John Coates about that, Minister Gillespie, or is he pretty much untouchable? Uh, look, I think um, any comments will be made by the appropriate people. I've said my piece. My question is to Libby Trickett. The recent withdrawal of Muddy Gross from the Tokyo 2021 Olympics raised many questions about the role that misogyny plays in professional sport. What kind of grassroots initiatives do you think are needed in order to tackle this issue at a fundamental level to make sure that such incidents do not occur again? It's a question directly to you, Libby, and, of course, Matty Groves uh, withdrew from the trials, saying that uh, it should be a lesson to all misogynistic perverts in sport. I'll use coarse language here. She said that you know, there were trainers who were staring at her tits while she was training, and she said you can no longer exploit young women and girls' body shame or medically gaslight them. When you heard all that, did it ring a bell with you? 
Yeah, it was a really interesting conversation that came up just before the Olympic trials just a few weeks ago. And it was a, a difficult thing to hear, I guess, about a sport that I really love and am very passionate about. And I didn't love the timing. Um, obviously, just before the Olympic trials, you didn't want any distractions for these athletes who have waited uh, another 18 months on top of what, you know, was already a four-year cycle. And so um, I was worried about how people would then look at, at swimming. For me, I've not experienced any sort of um, misogynistic uh, conversations to me personally, and I certainly wouldn't ever want to um, invalidate Maddie's experiences because I don't know what they are. And obviously, everyone has different experiences within their, their swimming careers or, or, or indeed in their lives. So, but for me, I think, I. I'm excited about the possible conversation, particularly around body image with young female athletes. And I think that is something that really needs to be um, discussed because that is something that is fundamentally part of our self-esteem and how we view ourselves not only as athletes but certainly as women as well. Yeah, just to, just to jump in there, Libby, if I can, because I know that you've, um, you've reflected on how the focus on, on skin folds, mm. on, on the folds of your skin and, heaven forbid, any sort of body fat that, that could be pinched or caught on your body, how that was noticed by your trainer and the overweening focus on that was a, was a real issue and, and messed with your head. Yeah, and I, I don't know whether that was because we have, uh, well, for me as an athlete, I was very much uh, the feeling that I was never enough, so I was constantly trying to push and prove myself and, and challenge myself to be more and show what I was capable of, and certainly that self-esteem with body image and being as lean as possible was something that was very much ingrained in that. Mm. And I think we need to be a 99% of coaches are men in swimming and we either need to c create an environment that women, female coaches come into the sport or we need to educate our male coaches uh, in how to speak to young female athletes because, you know, we need to be able to have these conversations, not just about the vehicle that is our bodies to create these performances, but, you know, talking about menstrual cycles, talking about um, how we feel about ourselves is something that is so important and I think will have a massive impact on our performances, not just as an athlete, but then in life after as well. Minister, I wanted to come to you because as the father of, um, of daughters, I mean, you would reflect on this, of course, and anyone who's gone through uh, uh, having daughters and raising them through puberty, but also through this very difficult period of lockdown where um, emotional issues and psychological issues have come to the fore, it must weigh on your mind when you've got a high-profile athlete like that calling out a sport and a sporting organisation that we all like to love and revere. Yeah, it was uh, distressing hearing the story and it's really sad that such a talented athlete has felt the only way she could um, solve the problem was to withdraw because she's probably put her life and soul into swimming. Mm. Uh, you know, I've, like you said, uh, uh, it's not appropriate to be that um, behaving in that way. In any workplace or sporting organisation or anything like that, um, People are much more aware of this and obviously um, it doesn't reflect well on um, the sport or the, the person involved. So uh, I think what Libby said is actually right on the money and uh, I think getting more female coaches might add a much more friendly um, mood and demeanour in the sport if, uh, if Lib what Libby said, that's, uh, I'm surprised there aren't more female coaches. Mm. Yeah, and, mm. and need to come up through the ranks as well. Russell? Yeah. Well, it, it, good on her, good on the athlete, really, for having the guts to do that and to call it out. Because, you know, culture... It's brought about an inquiry now into the culture it, exactly, as a result of it. Exactly, yeah. And culture, culture can be very, very hard to change. Uh, you know, it, it's, you can have one, an, an individual that can infiltrate a culture... <laughs> And then it can go bad, and, can, and then that bad, that bad element, then get, rubs off, rubs off on many people, and all of a sudden that becomes the culture. Mm. And you have to have these, you know, serious intervention moments in order to change culture. It's mm. not, it, it's, you know, I like to think culture is like a river, Virginia. You know, and they've <laughs> Where like are you changing. Going with this, Russell? Well, if you think <laughs> of culture as a river, they're very hard to change direction. Yeah, and if it's deep and if it's wide, it's even harder. 
So you have to sort of think of you have to think of culture like that. So if we are going to actually change this, we've got to really like put up a damn wall and start all over again. It's really tough to do. I work with vulnerable people and it has made me question that with the future supply of vaccines somewhat uncertain, there is a risk that the Australian federal government will follow the UK's lead and attempt to open the economy before we have reached herd immunity. It seems we are already seeing rhetoric compromised individuals should isolate with extreme caution while restri restrictions are eased. Would such an approach pose a risk to the well-being of immunocompromised Australians, many of whom are already marginalised by mainstream society? Well, I think the Minister's already anticipated some, uh, mm -hmm. to some degree a lot of the elements in that question, but Astrid, what do you think? Yes, it does pose a risk. And when we think about who is fully vaccinated in the future, uh, people who uh, aren't fully vaccinated in the future, that's going to be a level of... It's going to prevent certain access. It's, it may prevent them for, from doing certain things, accessing certain services, going to sport, etc., etc. It risks laying a new layer of marginalisation, a new layer of um, uh, disadvantaged over what we already had pre-COVID. That was people with disability, that was people uh, who are, uh, like myself, immunocompromised uh, with chronic illness, but it is all other forms of marginalisation mm. as well. We risk almost creating a two-tier or an, almost a new class system in Australia, including people uh, with chronic illness and disability. Libby Triggett, I know you had a visceral response to so-called Freedom Day in the UK. Mm. It didn't seem so delightful to you. What was your response? Yeah, I, it was just... It's just horrific to see that they have just opened up the doors yeah. and are yeah. basically letting the virus in. I mean, that just seems completely unbelievable that in this day and age that we would care so little about people who, you know, may not be able to be vaccinated or who are vulnerable people in our communities, our older um, members of the community. That scares me. And it scares me because I think... People are really sick of the situation that we're in in Australia. They're sick of locking down. They're sick of borders being slammed shut. They're sick of not being able to plan mm. holidays to anywhere outside of their state. And I think that's the really scary thing because if people tune out and start to look overseas and see everyone opening up, mm. they, they forget how many people have died um, to get to this point and then they're just opening up and even more people will become vulnerable. Um, and I know that with my... I have three young girls, you know, they're not vaccinated right now and the idea of opening up and potentially creating a situation where a whole new strain that attacks young children or people who are the most vulnerable in our communities, that, that really scares me. I know that, like many other Australians, it's been really difficult um, for you to manage your mental health and you made a, a big decision at the beginning of the pandemic and mm. lockdown to, to take care of yourself in that regard. Can you talk, tell us about that, Libby? Yeah, so I, throughout my um, life I've dealt with all different um, types of mental illness, including depression and postnatal depression, and um, through that situation in Brisbane. We've been so lucky in, in Brisbane. We've had yeah. the least, pro, pro, one of the least amount of lockdowns. But when we went into lockdown in March 2020, I knew with a, a six-month-old, a two-year-old and a not quite four-year-old, uh, not quite five-year-old, I should say, um, that I was going to have to really take care of myself. And I didn't have those um, things that I normally rely on, which was being able to access um, my psychologist and being able to exercise regularly in the ways that uh, allow me to manage my mental health. So I made the decision to go on to antidepressant medication, which has been just a lifesaver for me through this uncertain time, through these um, unprecedented times, I guess you could call them. Yeah. It's been a, a real benefit for me and something that I'm very happy that I took the steps to do um, all the way in March last year. But, you know, there are so many people who are struggling and will struggle if we start to go down the line of let her rip and see what happens. Russell? Well, the PM, is it maybe three weeks ago, the, the four-stage process was revealed, um, and which I, th I think that was great because it's actually going to... Pre it's preparing us for what's going to happen. There needs to be detail around the four stages, what that process actually looks like, which I know the Doherty Institute is looking into, so into the data. So at what mm. point... At what, at what point do we go from... We're in stage one now. At what point do we go into stage two? Then what point do we go into stage three? At some point, we will be letting the virus in. 
that, that, that is what is going to happen. There's going to be enough people that are vaccinated and as a result, it seems safe to let the virus in. And we have to prepare the country for that. We, people have to be aware that that is what is going to happen. Minister, you wanted to say something a moment ago. Um, yeah, look, it's really distressing. Just about the mental health issues, Libby, I'm really proud of you that you're sharing that with us. Thank you. But many people have had this problem. Uh, it is disrupting not just commerce, but people's lives. There's very lonely people who've been locked away for months during various lockdowns. The quickest way we can get out of this is to get that vaccine rollout which will put a level of protection, turning a really serious illness into a milder illness. It's not a universal, uh, absolute, um, uh, only one type of solution. You know, with the influenza, we have drugs like Tamiflu, uh, Relenza, as well as flu vaccines. And the same will happen with uh, this illness. Uh, the whole world is looking at new drugs, whether it's fancy new ones or combination therapies with older drugs that have antiviral capability, like we treated HIV. Mm -hmm. uh, it was untreatable for many years. When I was treating livers, liver disease with hep C, there was, first of all, just one drug, then two, and then all of a sudden we got combination therapy with multiple antivirals, and we have virtually can cure most people with hep C. Same with TB. That principle will apply with this illness. So for everyone out there, the best thing we can do is get ourselves vaccinated, follow all the easy things that aren't drugs, like hand hygiene. Sure. Like when you're in crowded places, all that stuff. And, 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 and also, Minister, just, just to jump in there... there. Just to jump in, because I do want to get to some other questions because we're running out of time. Uh, there was a report on the ABC this morning about the government, the federal government, not acting fast enough to secure those drug treatments that mm. will evolve now, as you're indicating, to now deal with what becomes an endemic disease like the ones that you mentioned. So uh, are you aware of and do you want to see real speed this time from your federal government to secure the drug treatments that will manage COVID-19 and its variants into the future? Oh, yes, definitely. Look, and uh, I, and I, and I, you've made any moves on week, that? Uh, look, we have a, a, a COVID evidence task force that is scanning the literature the whole time. I keep a track of it myself amongst my many duties. There are things evolving that will offer hope beyond just the vaccination. But the number one most important public health measure that we've got now, uh, until we can get effective treatments, mm. and I'm getting reports all the time, really exciting results, which I'll follow and the COVID Evidence Task Force will follow, and that is a next layer of defence against okay. the virus. As you say, it's going to be endemic. That yep. means it's going to float around all the time. As much as I appreciate the PM's apology today and his acceptance of responsibility for the mistakes that have plagued the vaccine rollout, it does very little in reality to deal with all the aftermath of the mixed messaging that we've had for the last few months. What do you reckon the governments at all levels need to do to work their way out of confusion that they've created around vaccination, transparently and without any of the political skullduggery or blame games? Is it at all possible that in this moment of need, our governments can pull their acts together and for once behave like the responsible adults that they all claim to be? <laughs> We'd like to return to the Federation, please, Minister Gillespie. Can, can we do that? Can everyone actually start yeah. working together? Yeah. Well, look, we have been working together, but as I said at the start, it's a 100-year event. Everyone's under the pump. Everyone's under pressure. Uh, the premiers are under pressure. The health system's under pressure. Uh, the delivery securing supplies around the world at the start of it, then securing vaccines getting production going in our own country. It's been a, an exceptional period. We will get through this, but mm -hmm. we all have to look positive, put our shoulder to the wheel and look forward, not in the rear vision mirror. Sure, there's been major hiccups and non-delivery of expected vaccines and all these other issues we've spoken about all this evening, but we will get through it. And there's always uh, a difference of opinion about stuff, but look, cherry picking individual um, areas of conflict, you've got to put that aside, like the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has been uh, put 
in a situation, and the premiers, there's no playbook. This hasn't happened in living memory. And as I said, a lot of my friends in the medical uh, systems of other countries look on us with envy. They just okay. think, how have you done it? So, look, we're all shoulder to the wheel. We're going to get through it. The vaccine rollout is speeding up and everyone will get a vaccine if they want it. And the more people that take it up, the better. And there's the horizon of treatment as well uh, on, the, on the horizon. OK. Let's uh, go through and all the panel to get a response to this final question. Libby Trickett. I just would like them to grow up, to be honest. I just really want our politicians, the people that are in, our, in power and are responsible for taking care of our communities, to look after us and actually do the job that we've asked them to do. You know, it feels so much like the responsibility and the burden has been placed on the states and on the individual communities. You know, we are the ones who have to stay at home. We are the ones who have to go into lockdown and do all of these things that, and miss out on job opportunities and, you know, you know, the art sector has been crushed and so many people are living away from their families due to lockdowns and things like that. It, I just want the states and the federal government to come together and actually come out with a clear, concise plan. It's, you know, however many um, uh, infected people in the community, OK, yeah. that, that triggers the lockdown. And it's very clear messaging to understand what is going to trigger a lockdown, what is going to trigger, um, you know, siloing um, LGAs and things like that. Just okay. to, to make it really clear and concise, to make it easier for everybody to breathe a little bit easier. Well, let's hear from the rest of our panel as well. Just briefly, if we can, uh, Bill Shorten. I think um, Australians needed hope. Um, to answer the question, of, I think that we need, we deserve to be told nationally, where's the finishing line? There's 13 and a half million people locked down, businesses are screwed, uh, it's uh, tough for families, there's mental health trauma. Where's the finishing line? When can we finish lockdown? And I think we can, and, but then what we also need to do is once we know the number, one, we need to future-proof our country, we need more sophisticated border controls, we need proper research, we need to learn that we're going to live with masks, perhaps. But okay. I just wish the government, the feds, Mr Morrison, would lead now. I mean, the doctors have done their bit, the scientists have done their bit, the people are doing their bit right now. It's now turn for the government to step up. Russell Howcroft? Uh, just detail around that four-stage plan, detail around what hurdles you have to jump to go from one to two, three, two to three, etc. Communicate that very hard, get alignment with all the states and the feds around that plan, and in the meantime, have a very generous uh, floor financial floor for those that are really finding yeah. it very tough. For example, the music industry. Mm. Astrid Edwards? Uh, I'd like to second what Libby said. I think it's time for our decision makers and our leaders to grow up and definitely financial floor for um, uh, those industries who need it. And uh, that's all we have time for this evening. Would you please thank our panel, Astrid Edwards, Russell Howcroft, Bill Shorten, Libby Trickett and David Gillespie. And thank you for all your questions and a big shout-out to our wonderful audience in Brisbane tonight. It's lovely to see people outside and free. I don't really understand what I'm seeing right now. I'll be back with you next week live in Melbourne and you can join me tomorrow morning on ABC Radio Melbourne, and I hope you do. Stay safe. Good night. Go well.